Welcome to Cream, Eggs and Jam. A podcast for food nerds with show and tell by Elise Bullbrook and Scott Bagnell. We love to cook with cream, eggs and jam and learn from food people who give a damn. So join us each week for thoughts, tips and tricks with guests, recipes and more in the mix. Episode six, Elise. Welcome to Cream, Eggs and Jam, everyone. I am Scott Bagnall. And I'm Elise Poolbrook. Welcome to our podcast, Cream, Eggs and Jam. It's so nice to have you with us. And today I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country. And today I'm coming to you from Yuggera country. And we'd like to start this week by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're recording our podcast today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Woohoo. Well, the chill is in the air, Scotty Bagnall. It's the 1st of June. Yeah. Winter has arrived, hasn't it's it? It's arrived. And the topic of our podcast today will be something that makes us warm during winter, something that winter warms warmers. the cockles, as they would say. I don't know who, but some <laughs> of them would. <laughs> what is a cockle, by the way? Like, what is a cockle? Uh, is it a rude thing? Oh, I like, don't know. <laughs> Should we be have saying to, this? I don't know. But <laughs> today we're talking tea. <laughs> <laughs> we're not talking cockles. Cockles, pippies. Yeah. Look, that's warm another beverages. tangent. We're talking warm beverages. <laughs> now, Warm beverages. It is cold in Brisbane today, Elise. It is 15 degrees. Can you believe it? <laughs> Well, no, uh, it's not cold. <laughs> I'm sorry. In that Melbourne, is freezing. it was a, it was six degrees today. Okay, and um, okay, I don't know. Fifteen mean. is a luxury, buddy, o pal. <laughs> 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 anyway, it's perfect tea weather either way. Any excuse yes. for a cuppa, and any excuse to feel like you're receiving a warm hug from your beverage. Um, mm, in today's yes. episode of Cream Eggs and Jam, we will be talking to. The Tea Merchant from Tea Drop Teas. It's a store at the South Melbourne Market here in Victoria, or in Melbourne, I should say. And um, it, he also has an online store. Uh, we will also be talking to a tea nerd and a fully fledged tea mer- nerd, may I add. Um, we'll be talking to Jordan, Jordan Lightyear, as she's known on Instagram. Um, <laughs> I can't wait for this. Yeah. But first, before we deep dive into tea, let's have yes. a little bit of a chat, Scotty Bagnall, about this week's MasterChef Challenge. Let's chat what we would have done if we were yes. confronted with a green wall. <laughs> the great green wall. It was impressive. Mm. Sunday night's um, elimination episode, they had to do a taste test. And look... I know that everyone at home is probably sitting on their couch going, that's so easy, look at all these things. But the MasterChef pressure does something to your head and the most obvious looking things, you can just second guess yourself and get it wrong. Mm. Um, You try and be tricky. Like I think strategy comes into it and you can see some of the contestants were exercising strategy. Like you leave some things because you think that's easy. I might pick something off that's um, a little bit harder. Mm. Um, But then like I always, I know I was on the couch on Sunday night going, choose the easy stuff. And some of the things they were guessing, I'm like, oh my gosh, that like Mm. is not visually obvious. Um, But, yeah, interesting. How did you go on Mm. tasting challenges on MasterChef? I think you did pretty good. We both did well. Come on, Scotty. (laughs) What would you have made in round two of the Green Wall Challenge, Scotty? Ooh, I immediately thought of a dish that I actually made on MasterChef um, with the Cavolo Nero, um, which is a beautiful whiting ballantine that I like to do. And you roll up the whiting in the Cavolo Nero. Um, you get this beautiful bright green outside and the perfect white flesh of the whiting fillet in the middle um, mm. and I roll them up and I steam them and then slice them. They kind of look a little bit like sushi 
Um, and th- this is a fusion food for you. <laughs> I, I like to pair it with this white soy cream sauce. So it's sort of like this French-based cream sauce that uses these Asian flavors. So white soy predominantly to season the cream sauce, which goes really well with the fish. And then I do a little tarragon. So I'd use a lot of the herbs on the wall, tarragon and chive oil that's like sprinkled over the top and you get this Mm. split sauce that you put the bright green oil into the cream sauce and when you pour it around the little Ballantines, you get this beautiful like kaleidoscope of colours and flavours. And it's just super cute. I love it. So that's what I would have done. You love fiddly things, don't you? I do love fiddly (laughs) things. (laughs) Oh, dear. I love cooking in bulk. So I would have made... (laughs) What would you have done? I would have done something less fiddly, less uh, refined. I would have done something rustic Mm. because it's just who I am, but something delicious, of course. And... I also would have gone for the cavalanero. If you don't know what cavalanero is, it's Tuscan kale and it's a really mm. deep, deep green. Um, mm. The uh, colour is magnificent. Leafy green. It's in the, you know, the same, uh, I suppose, category of vegetable as spinach, silver mm. beet. Um, yes. You know, other varieties of kale. Um, what I really love about Tuscan kale or Cavalonero is that it really retains its colour when you, you know, cook it. Mm, it does. <laughs> you know, not like sorrel, for go example. Like brown. And, yes. As soon as you heat sorrel, uh, you know, a light green sorrel, it will go brown like immediately. Whereas Tuscan kale, Instant. You, yeah, you can, you know, cook it for a little bit. And um, it really does stay green um, unless you, I don't know, do something like cook like my mum and um, maybe <laughs> cook it for two hours and then it does go grey. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Boil the heck out of it as uh, my mum <laughs> likes to prepare her broccoli. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, I would have made, so the River Cafe London has a recipe for a cavalonero pesto. Okay. Mm, yes. And I've noticed it in some other books that have been more Ooh. recently published. You know, cookbooks often rip each other off. I'm just going to put that out there. And uh, anyway, I'm watching you. <laughs> 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 if you're a cookbook author and you're doing it, people I, know. Well, I know because I am an obsessive person when it comes to books. Anyway, the River Cafe London has this Tuscan <laughs> kale Sorry, pesto. What you, what you do is you uh, bring a large pot of water to the boil, the kind of pot that mm-hmm. you would boil pasta. I don't make pasta in a pot any smaller than about five litres. You need a nice uh, mass volume of water so the pasta can you know, move freely through the bubbling water. Mm-hmm. Um, now, before you go to cook your pasta, you blanch your greens. So you throw Mm -hmm. in the Tuscan kale. And if you've got some other greens kicking about in the fridge, chuck them in too. Um, Pull them out with a slotted spoon, pop it into a blender, add a little bit of the boiling water, just a little bit, and Mm. blend. Okay, so you Mm. should start to develop a um, green slurry. I Mm. then um, heat up a little fry pan, just a small fry pan. I add a little bit of olive oil. Um, and I cook some bruised garlic. I just smash it a little bit, Ooh, and yes. I cook off a little bit, of, a little bit of that heat off the garlic in the pan. Mm-hmm. Um, and the oil would probably be, you know, one to two centimeters deep in quite a uh, small pan. I'm going to end up using this oil in this pesto. Um, I'm essentially making like a little bit of a confit garlic and I don't want to add raw garlic to this pesto. I want to cook it a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. That oil Mm -hmm. and that garlic goes into the blender. You can chuck a couple of anchovies in there if you'd like. This deviates from the River Cafe recipe, but, you know, (laughs) this is is my adaptation. Um, Mm -hmm. And some beautiful local pecorino cheese. Um... I would say don't use the most expensive Grana Padano. Don't use, you know, something that is going to get lost in this pesto. A local pecorino is good enough. Um, it's good yep. on the hip hip pocket as well. Um, great, you know, a really generous amount of cheese into the blender. No, I'm not even giving you 
at quantities here. This is this is what intuitive cooking is about. It's knowing how to balance things, you know, blend mm. it, taste it. Does it need more cheese? Add a little more cheese. Does it need a little bit more viscosity? Have you added too much water from the pot? You know, that's an opportunity mm. to perhaps find more greens. <laughs> <laughs> try and try and um, make it make it quite thick because this is going to be a sauce to coat the pasta. Cook the pasta, drain the pasta, get it into a pan, get that green slurry, that really bright green mm. pesto in with the pasta. Um, why not chuck in some frozen baby peas as well for texture? My choice of pasta would be cavatelli, a nice handmade cavatelli, especially would be mm. wonderful. And they would, um, those peas would sit nicely in the crevices, and that would be my green dish. Ooh, <laughs> I love that. Mm. Mm. I think that sounds delicious. Ali yes. made something similar with a gnocchi, oh. um, but I think. She fell into the trap and I think eliminations you always do of overcomplicating it. But also judging of food is subjective. We have to acknowledge that. Yes. You know. Yes. Playing the MasterChef game, it can be tricky. And on that day, whatever Ali made wasn't the judge's cup of tea. Oh, oh, segue. <laughs> that was a magnificent segue Thank you. into today's Thank you. topic. Yes. So our topic is tea. Our first guest today is Mr. Ashok Dios. He is a tea merchant and the founder of Tea Drop Tea. Now, we went to Tea Drop Tea quite a lot during MasterChef. It was at the South Melbourne markets, which we frequented regularly. And we uh, we cooked with quite a bit of Tea Drop Tea in the, mm. uh, in the apartments where we lived and um, drank a lot of their tea as well. So That's I'm right. excited to talk to Ashok. Tea Drop um, was born in 2003. When I came to Australia as an international student, I worked in a cafe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is 99 onwards. And then I got exposed to coffee and I was working in a, a cafe and a coffee roaster, Veneziano Coffee. After graduating from uni, my focus was trying to become an investment banker, study banking finance. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to make real money <laughs> fast. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, but I, I never got the opportunity after graduating from uni. I wasn't uh, Australian resident. And on a bridging visa, I just couldn't get a graduate uh, position. So my boss at that point, Rocky Veneziano, right, yep. from Veneziano yep. Coffee, offered me a job at his newly formed coffee roaster. Then when I was working there and I'm trying to meet clients and seeing what's going on and how they were focusing on specialty coffee, uh, there was a... A lack of, uh, I don't know whether you guys can remember, but in the early 2000s, it was just paper tea bags. Mm. It was uh, poorly. There were no competing brands. There was only one large brand that is in that was in hospitality. T2 was in every store. Wherever you went, you saw orange boxes. Yes. Every cafe. Away. There was a, um, uh, a cafe operator. Like we're a, I'm a small business, and I moved around Australia trying to get clients, and um, even one customer told me on at in Bondi Beach, right? Hey, why are you trying to sell tea when there's tea too already? How demotivating is that? But I thought, you know what? I'm going to do it. And I took the risk of, uh, I went with Peter Wolf because I didn't know about tea. I went to Sri Lanka. Yes. My family has tea plantations, but I wouldn't buy from uh, because it's family. I wanted to use the principles of Mm. specialty coffee and focusing on sourcing the right product which matches the flavor profile of the consumer not uh, because it's my family I'm going to go and buy from the family so yes. Peter Wolf we went and studied and all the tea tasters in Sri Lanka was totally confused because Peter Wolf is really good in tea he, he's good in coffee but he's good in tea also so mm. he, right. he made my English breakfast blend he made my honeydew green tea blend wow. he made uh, our, uh, before it was a lavender Earl Grey served at Star City and stuff that's what he made He and then he said these are the principles to do tea tasting this is the source this is how to do it etc etc and that's how tea drop started 
that just goes to show food stories aren't always just about the food. There's always more to it. This is a story yeah. that's much bigger than a food business. Um, yeah, this is more than different. hospitality. This is politics. Yeah. This is this is a migration story. Yeah. This is an yeah. issue in our in our social system. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, Ashok, when you mentioned the principles of specialty coffee and how you wanted to transfer them into your process of purchasing and sourcing tea, I'm wondering mm. if you could walk us through what those principles are and what that means for tea drop. In coffee, for example, or in food, if you guys are cooking like chefing or uh, if you're a, a bartender uh, making a cocktail... You try to source if the her, if it's like you know mint. You try to source the freshest mint. Mm -hmm. If it's if you're a coffee roaster, you source fresh green coffee. You roast it, and you don't just store it. You roast it, wait for fourteen days, and then you then only you start uh, brewing your coffee. You don't just roast and uh, let it sit in big pellets away. Right? Mm. Coffee is still drinkable after two years. Roasted. But the prime flavor profile is after the 14 days, for example. Yes. When you're cooking, if you go to South Melbourne Market, when you take, see the fresh... Like today, this morning, I went with my wife shopping, like grocery shopping. So uh, the veggies are fresh. Same principle. When it comes to tea, try to source fresh tea and try to turn it around fast as possible. Mm-hmm you will be able to identify the flavor profile of... You don't have to be a tea taster. You will identify the flavor of fresh tea and poorly stored old stale tea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is very easy. And I'll tell you the tea tasting style. Mm -hmm. Every cup of tea should tell a story. Oh, so even this. coffee or when you're drinking tea, if you're drinking an English breakfast tea, it can, it can be colored water... If you taste it, drink it, and there is no body, no flavor. So it starts from the front, it all it goes all the way to the back, and you don't want to have a bad story, right? You want yes. to have a good story. And when you start when the flavors start lingering in your mouth, which is pleasant to you, and what you're expecting, and it's just it just connects with you. Oh wow, it tastes good. Okay, it's malty. Okay, I do get fruity notes. So my tea is blended in small batches. It's If you look at any of the um, pouches or the products, it comes every every two to three weeks fresh tea, sourced from, uh, source from wherever. And we, st like, like, according to the temperature requirements, we have a separate section for uh, cool, cool, uh, like a cool room. Oh, I, wow, yeah. I applied these principles from the start. Wow. And does the tea change? Like, even if you're sourcing the tea from the same area, every time you go and taste it, is it different? It changes. Wow. changes. It changes. Mm. Like fruit. Like yes. veggies. Sunlight, moisture, humidity, rain. Yes. And so you can never say, ah, this is my blend. Estate 1, 50%. Estate 2, 30%. And that's it. You can't do that. Like, if you guys are master chef guys, right? Yeah. So when you are cooking, right, you all can't apply the same. Like you buy a fish today, and buy a fish tomorrow, or buy potatoes today and potatoes tomorrow. Same place. Yes. Same farm. Taste different. So you got to start feeling and understanding what you want to communicate. Like that's what I said. It's like a story, right? What yes. are you trying to communicate with your customer? And then you just need to have your basic principles about flavor, what mm. you want to achieve. And it's about consistently tasting to see to that. You've got a consistent blend. If you're selling bad tea, mm. if you make it good tea, customers will complain because they're used to bad tea. So <laughs> yes. Consistent in what you do and yep. just focus mm. on that. Yeah. That's one of the things I love mm. about your teas is that they're all quite creative and different like I'm having a lovely cup today this is one of my favorites because I'm a big Earl oh, Grey cool, yeah. fan yeah. and the yeah. cream of Earl Grey is so yeah. lovely because it's just got these additional f um, floral notes and it's got the same notes as an Earl Grey tea but it's but just simple. different and it's subtle yeah. and it's beautifully balanced how yeah. do you come up with your ideas so what I did was 
before I came to Australia to study banking finance uh, back home in Sri Lanka uh, when I was younger my 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 parents said oh, why won't you go to hotel school so I went to hotel school and in Sri Lanka they had a school called Swiss Asian school it was part of Lausanne yeah mm-hmm. or, or so, a Swiss hotel school yeah but in Sri Lanka when I finished, uh, when I passed the exam, I passed the hotel school really well. I came second in the batch and I was oh, wow. really good in cooking and I understood the flavors. I understood hospitality. But I never wanted to work in a hotel. I saw the way customers treated their general managers. They shout at you. You've got to put your head down because customer is your lifeblood. You've got to, you've got oh, yes. to agree whatever they say and send a bottle of champagne. I didn't want to do that. Hotel school taught me about how to identify flavors so, and again, when I worked at uh, with uh, under Peter Wolf, what he always told me was, whatever you do, right, don't mask the flavor of the product that you're trying to sell. Mm. So, if you take, uh, we'll take cream of Earl Grey, right, yes. and it's a Bai Mudan, it's a white tea, right? Yes. Which okay. is not normal, is it, mm, for an Earl Grey? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, a premium, uh, it's, a, it's the least processed tea, mm. yeah. Lower in caffeine, and because there's less human intervention, right, mm-hmm. you have more subtle hues from this tea. It's very, it's very, very subtle. Yes. Now, my objective was to create an Earl Grey for the afternoon, or oh, create an Earl Grey for early evenings and when in a restaurant after dinner right if you serve something like a, a lemon sorbet oh this yeah will go. and we always talk with chefs and restauranters and we talk about how we can have a unique dinner menu yes tea menu right yeah. it can be of course there might be a little bit of caffeine but a lot mm. of people drink Grey's at night yes why drink a black Earl Grey, right? When you can have this beautiful floral green tea, uh, uh, white tea, which oh, is tea. naturally f- light in flavor and add a touch of bergamot, right? Yes. And again, if you notice, the bergamot we have is cold pressed bergamot oil, mm-hmm. which does not taste like a fake flavor. It doesn't. No, it's really vibrant yeah. and fresh. Yeah. So it's about just. Going I through that it. process and understanding our customers. And we don't work in retail. Our retail is mainly through our online store. My lifeblood, I worship every cafe operator, every restaurant, every hotelier. They are like, my God, like if they call, if it's a hundred dollar account or a thousand dollar account, I run to them because all these guys only, you know, support us and help me create all these really cool flavors. Mm. Which require, yeah, ask yeah. Me. Ashok, what I'm wondering in this flavor development process, you obviously have yeah. to choose your tea leaf variety, your essential oils, your your mm. dried fruit, perhaps, or other other yeah. flowers. Um, yeah. uh, I'm wondering, you know, if you could explain to our listeners what that selection process includes. How do you divide your ranges of tea, and what okay. tea leaves are available to choose from mm. uh, when you start to develop a product? Okay, so as a, um, I don't tell myself, I'm not a tea farm owner, for example, right? Mm-hmm. I'm a tea merchant, so I use my connections to access teas from all over the world, mm-hmm. right? So that's the first thing. So you can buy single origin, single listed, single family owned tea plantation, all the way to large, like large manufactured quantities of tea there is access to tea from around the world right Mm -hmm. it is my skill set right which I focus on flavor standard and the sourcing so first tick is you might have a really really good tea but it it might not be sustainable Mm -hmm. and it might not be ethical so we work with um um, a company called ETP, Ethical Tea Partnership in the UK, mm-hmm. and they give us a list of places where we can source. Then second part is after ethical sustainability, you need to decide whether it's going to be a black tea or a green tea or a herbal tea. Now, mm. if it's a black tea, 
is it and when is it in the evening is it in the afternoon is it in the morning what is the customer looking for is it a single origin are they trying to serve this tea with uh, um like steak so then you can do like a lapsang sushi which has that really nice pine wood smoked tea that mm. when when it's at about 70 degrees you can actually enjoy the the tea right it doesn't burn your tongue right yes. and you enjoy your food so you need to we study that whole process to understand where when and who what the consumer wants okay then i after. love that you're thinking about how it's pairing with food and what time of yeah, day yeah. you're drinking it yeah. restaurants we are we are a hospitality brand and mm. and where can people get your tea if it's yes. not in a cafe where online Perfect. online or south melbourne market Beautiful. Yes, we visited your South Melbourne market quite a few times during Master Chef. Um, oh, okay. and you've got an amazing tasting bar there so you can taste mm, a yeah. lot of your teas which is and so good. And that's the reason why I set it up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for yes. us it was very strategic because your tea was in the Master Chef pantry. And so we needed yes. to do some recipe development and I I know <laughs> that Scotty and I were both obsessed with uh developing recipes with your jasmine tea and yes. um Oh, it's absolutely beautiful. Um I had the privilege of of going to China in 2017 and yeah. um in Chengdu, you know, jasmine tea, it's a culture. It's a part of the yeah. way of life. It's what you, it's what you do. You you go you have afternoon tea. You have morning, you have tea in the morning and when you drink tea yeah. there, um the tea leaves are loose in the glass. Um you know, you you sip not tea from a tea bag or tea that has been strained from a teapot necessarily. They don't do tea bags there. No. Mm. And like Chengdu, right? For example, like I'll give you a quick explanation about how jasmine tea is done the correct way. So after the tea is processed, like during the process what they do is they they cover the tea with the jasmine buds and and at night the jasmine buds open up and the teas absorb the flavor and the aroma that's the pu- oh, that that's wow. and they keep on turning it and turning it around and then you get jasmine tea now after you get the jasmine tea pricing works on more you remove the jasmine leaf because the the jasmine flower gives bitterness mm-hmm. if you remove jasmine it will be bitter so i believe that if you are cooking you all will not put jasmine petals for visual enhancement because it has a bitter flavor profile mm-hmm. so more jasmine flowers you remove more expensive the tea is mm-hmm. so the really good jasmine tea you will find only one or two like a visual enhancement but the tea does not have jasmine wow flowers and it's natural try your jasmine tea you will you most of the jasmine teas you drink you it tastes like um, maybe like a perfume perfume tea it's not natural you can add jasmine flavor you can without going through that process you can that's why jasmine dragon pearls are so popular yeah i There think i th- now that you mention it i'm not sure if i've come across another brand other than yours that has reminded me so much of the tea that I did drink in Chengdu. Maybe that's why I have an affinity with it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um Ashok, thank you so much for chatting with us this afternoon um and sharing your passion and your personal story as a as a tea merchant. I've got a long story. If oh, I tell you it's thing, inspiring. Right? It's so inspiring as people that are finding their, you know, finding their way in food. I know on behalf of Scotty and I we're so fortunate to hear your story because it yeah. it puts winds in it in your sails it makes you feel that you, you know anything it. is possible yeah good <laughs> so let's stay in touch and thank mm. you for giving me the opportunity yeah no thank you worries. so much for talking you. to us yeah drink Absolutely. good tea like too much That was so interesting I love how Ashik was talking about blending these teas with you know time of day food pairings i have never thought about tea in that way before for some reason i've always thought about tea sort of a little bit in isolation and i think it's so interesting to 
hear his approach in terms of blending these marvellous tea creations together and how mm. much detail he goes into in ensuring these teas suit the time of day, the food you're eating, the ambiance. It's so good. Yeah. So I have this dream of a farm-to-table restaurant, Scotty, and all mm. of a sudden that conversation has just inspired me to have a tea menu that is like a degustation um, tea pairing um, oh, yeah. You know when you go to a restaurant and you can opt to have wine pairings with your mm-hmm. degustation, why not offer tea as well? Look, there's a whole world of tea. This is the thing. I actually am going to make a lap song sushong with the steak. That's what I want to do now. Oh, can I share with you a recipe that I love to make with lap song sushong tea? Yes. <laughs> It is one of my favourites and it is born from this childhood memory that mum would make. This is seriously my favourite dish that mum would make for us as kids and I still request it to this day. Um, She would call it spicy, saucy, spare ribs. (laughs) And here's another fusion dish for you. This is my, you know, 80s, 90s childhood upbringing in the era of fusion. Um, And she would just make it with black tea and pork spare ribs and um, you would soak the spare ribs in the tea and cook them in the oven and then you'd drain the tea off and then you'd make a sauce, which mum would just do super simple. It would be like tomato ketchup, some of the tea that you've strained off of the pork spare ribs Mm. and um, some barbecue sauce. It was super simple. There's probably not a lot else in it. Um, but it was really, really good. And then you put it back in the oven and you'd bake it and caramelise the ribs and it would be in this, like, sauce. Um, and so I do a version of it um, which ramps up the Asian flavours because I think that just adds this another level of complexity. And the Lapsang Shusong tea is this smoked tea. It's smoked pine wood tea. If you haven't had it, it's got this beautiful smoky aroma. The complexity that that brings to the pork is so good. Cook it in the oven in this Lapsang Shusong tea and it imparts all this beautiful flavor. And then I also add into the tea a lot of Chinese spices, so star anise, cinnamon, mandarin peel, because the mandarin in that citrus note goes really well with the pork as well. Um, Star anise, Szechuan pepper, all of these beautiful Asian aromats, and it just infuses that pork with flavor. And then you drain it off and add some more of those aromats, so ginger, Szechuan pepper, rice wine, chosing wine, dark soy, brown sugar. Mm. Um, so it's got this beautiful dark caramel sauce um, and some tomato passata. So it's a little bit more fresher oh my than God, their tomato sauce. <laughs> it's so good. This is seriously like the best recipe. You're going to have and to put you... the recipe somewhere for our oh, listeners. Yeah. I will have to do that. It is so good. And you mm. mix all the sauce up, pour it back over the ribs, put it in the oven, bake it, um, and I do it with a kumquat rice. Um, we can do it with <laughs> a mandarin rice. Oh my gosh. What is a kumquat <laughs> rice? It's just like kumquats, fresh kumquats um, blitzed up and put through the rice um, with a bit of ginger. So Before you get like ginger cooked? as you're cooking it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Before it's okay. cooked. And you get like this citrusy um, bit of ginger, goes so well with all the Asian aromats. It is delicious. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> this is the re- the ingredient list is quite long. So this is definitely one to, to write up and uh, post somewhere for the, for the listener because you know I'm, I've forgotten how many things are in this already. But I, I want it. I want to try it. I'm really curious. It's an interesting flavor profile. Um, I am also going to add to this that what I really liked about our conversation with Ashok was that he mentioned that there is a commitment to ethically sourcing tea Mm. and that there is an accreditor that he goes to when he is looking for Mm. which growers are, um, you know, considered, I suppose, sustainable and ethical. Now, the words sustainable and ethical in our modern world can often be loaded words used... uh, you know, to hook consumers into a product that isn't necessarily fulfilling those ambitions. Um, They can be so superficial, can't they? There's so much greenwashing out there with sustainability that 
Mm. You can never be sure. Yeah, so I'm I'm particularly interested to go and check out what that accreditation ex- process yes. is like. You know, that's what my food nerdery tends to be like. And uh, I want to know, you know, about how the accreditor deals with the fact that tea plantations are often these intensive monocultures. So farms that only grow one thing, farms that, um, you know, don't necessarily have a lot of biodiversity because they want high yield of one type of of product Mm. Um, and that can have severe environmental impacts. So, you know, tea can be a quite a complex topic when it comes to um, ecology. Um, I know that a friend of mine loves to celebrate agroecology and um, Mm. this is, this is a term that's used um, where uh, farming does respect biodiversity and preserving biodiversity in soil, um, the biodiversity of, of plant life um, that's needed for, for, I suppose, vibrant, healthy, sustainable crops. Um, Mm. So I'm interested in that whole accreditation experience when it comes to ethically sourced Tea. I'm, I'm going to look more. that up. Anywho, we've spoken to a tea merchant. Yes. Now we will be talking to the ultimate tea consumer. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be talking to a friend of mine. And if you were to look at her Instagram, you would see that uh, Miss Jordan Lightyear is an avid tea lover, consumer, drinker. Um, <laughs> She's a friend of mine and I don't know many others who are obsessive about tea as Jordan. Now, Jordan, I was wondering if you could please help me explain to our mm-hmm. listeners um, just how yes. obsessed with tea you are and how obsessed you have been. Um, oh please gosh. tell us about your life with tea. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually thinking about this today. I was like, when mm. did I like first fall in love with tea? Mm. And I don't actually recall any specific moment, to be honest. Like when I was a kid, I I grew up drinking Lipton, um, which (laughs) (laughs) like I, well, no judgment to people that drink Lipton, but I just feel like it's like the very, you know, (laughs) (laughs) but I was just like, you know, I didn't come from anywhere sort of fancy with my tea drinking and then. My mum, um, we were in, we we're on Brunswick Street one day and my mum took me into T2 and I was just like, you know, I, I can't believe this. There's so many different <laughs> things, so many different colours and flavours and smells and, yeah, it was just kind of from there that I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then I actually got a job at T2 and, yeah, kind oh, of cool. took off from there. Yeah. I'm wondering, do you remember the first tea you purchased? Mm. You know, not the, the, a tea that you had at home but the first tea you mm, bought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was you Melbourne do. Breakfast from T2, which mm. is a um, black tea with vanilla. And oh, I actually don't drink it anymore because I overdid it like a decade oh, ago. Oh, yes. Yeah, I've done and now that when before. I drink it, yeah, 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 I can't drink it anymore. I'm like, this is too much. But I, at the time, yeah. I just loved it. Yeah. I've done that with goat. Adam shot 13 goats. goats. <laughs> <laughs> with a goat. That is so random. <laughs> I struggle to eat it now. <laughs> anyway, I've done that with goat. Goats. I don't think it's I've ever much. tried goat before. Oh, well, the next time um, he goes uh, hunting, yeah. I'll, um, I'll keep that in mind, <laughs> particularly if he shoots 13 of them. So, okay. <laughs> I was going to ask being mm. a tea nerd, I am interested. Mm. Um, we love to do like tips and tricks on this show. Um, yes. And so I imagine you have probably gone down mm-hmm. the rabbit hole of um, Googling and researching all sorts of different things relating to tea. Do you yeah. have, if someone wants to become a tea nerd, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> what um, top tips have you got for like, you know, the perfect cup of tea? What's your favourite tea? Yeah. Mm, so I, I love to make um, I love to make tea latte. So I'm a sucker for a black tea Ooh. that's like honey, milk, um, like really decadent. So, and a lot of people would come into tea too, and you know you taste the teas on the tasting bar, and they go home and they brew it, and they go, it just does not taste the same. How did you do that? Mm. And I think a lot of people are really following strictly the instructions on the back of the box, which I always say is a bit of a mistake because I think that brewing your cup of tea is so personal. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think you have to experiment, find the kind of brew that you like the best rather than just doing exactly how the box says. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and when it comes to making the tea lattes, I think brewing for like three times as long as the box says is, you know, it's going to be great. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I've never heard of a tea latte. Is this something new? Ooh. Is this something that you've developed? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's a new thing. I feel like it's basically just um, a tea with milk and honey. So it's nothing, you know, revolutionary. It's just, <laughs> it's literally just. <laughs> Scotty's I like from to Brisbane. Call it a tea latte. <laughs> Scotty's, oh, Scotty's okay. from Brisbane. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, <Nah>, basically. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> now we Is this understand. a Melbourne thing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, just think of like your chai latte. Think of your chai latte. Right. Um, but you can do that with any tea, essentially. Do you heat the milk up? When I'm feeling, when I'm not lazy, yes. <laughs> but if I'm feeling really lazy, no. Mm. But to get it the best, I would say yes, heat your milk up for mm. sure. Do you have a favorite teacup? Because I find, like, I drink a lot of coffee, but mm. when I have tea, I need a completely different cup. I, yes. I need I need a chunky ceramic cup for coffee and I need mm-hmm. a fine china cup for tea. I yes. can't drink tea out of, like, a chunky ceramic cup. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I'm like, I am actually banned from buying drinking vessels, for lack of a better word. <laughs> yes, <laughs> vessel is the house, appropriate term. Mm. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm a sucker for a drinking vessel. And when it comes to tea, it, the finer the lip, the better. I like, agree. I barely want to feel it touching my lip. Do you know yes. what I mean? <laughs> yes. Yep. Why is that? Definitely. What is it with tea and that? I don't know. I don't know. I just, I think the fancy lip, like the fine lip is very fancy and you just go, yeah, this is it. Oh, so do you have a different teacup for morning and evening? I what do. does a morning teacup <laughs> look like and what does an evening so, teacup look like? I'm interested. So, <laughs> so in the morning I'm drinking from a fine lip. It's the morning. It's, you know, I want to mm-hmm. start my day feeling very fancy. And then in <laughs> like the afternoon, <laughs> and in the afternoon I've just got my sort of big mug where it's like, <laughs> it's more like I've had a full day. I'm ready for just like tea in my face. <laughs> <laughs> How many cups of tea are we talking a day? Ooh. My goodness. I probably drink like, <laughs> mm. I have to say, I probably drink a couple of litres of tea a day. Really? Yeah. yeah. My, your, yeah. If anyone was to peruse your Instagram, I would say yeah. they would think that you don't drink water. It looks like <laughs> <laughs> perhaps I actually, tea is your hydration. <laughs> um, I've actually been throughout my life really bad at drinking water. Um, I just drink tea all the time and then I'm actually breastfeeding my eight month old baby at the moment. And so I've had to make like a conscious effort to drink water because otherwise I'm pretty sure she'd just be drinking like tea through my breast milk all the time. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if that's too much information, but I don't think so. I just had a great visual. Imagine. Yeah. (laughs) It would be tea latte, limit. wouldn't it? Tea latte. <laughs> it's been like it's been interesting with breastfeeding because I have to think about my caffeine intake as well. So it's been like a journey this year to go on like looking for you know caffeine free teas, decaf teas. Ooh. Yeah. Mm, What's mm. a good caffeine free tea? Have you found one? Yeah. Um, so I love rooibos, which is a mm. South African tea. Um, it's caffeine free. They call it rooibos or red bush. Um, it's it's probably the closest you can get to a black tea without having caffeine in it, unless you want to go down the the decaf road. But I don't think decaf black teas are very good. They're I just didn't like even know something. they did a decaf black tea. Yeah, like you can get them at the supermarket. I think you know, like your Twinings. I think they do one. T two recently introduced one. It's actually probably the best one I've tried, but it's still mm. just not the same. So I go for a mm. Roybus instead. Mm. Jordan. You have a gorgeous mug that I just saw. Uh, what is in yep. your mug tonight? So I'm drinking, uh, it's called Daintree Black. So it's a black tea from the north of Australia. Um, and it's by this brand I just discovered in Sydney when I was up there a couple of weeks ago called Tea Totaler. Um, I think they're run just by like husband and wife, like really small business. Um, yeah, it's just a black tea with milk delicious and exactly what a mum who's been at home with her eight-month-old baby um, needs at 6 p.m. on a Wednesday. (laughs) (laughs) It's so wholesome. 
Yes. And yes. that, that mug you. is yep. is gorgeous. You've got oh, a mug there with a dinosaur isn't on it amazing? a tricycle with glasses. Dinosaurs, and pizza. pizzas, hot dogs, bananas. Yeah, it's my fave. One of. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you find something like this? What's what's your? Uh... I, I actually was gifted this cup. Which, Ooh. when someone gave me this cup, I thought, you know me so well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, (laughs) that's a good one. Jordan, I'm wondering, you know, for your palate, what is the ideal picture of the ideal cup of tea? You know, and I say, I ask this question is what's the ideal Mm. picture? Because where are you sitting? You know, what's the ambiance? And and, and what have you brewed? What's what's in that cup in that moment? Okay, so for me, morning is my favorite time of day. So I've, you know, I've woken up, oh, it's raining outside, it's cloudy, I've put the kettle on. I'm brewing at the moment, I'm brewing an Earl Grey, just your standard Earl Grey. Mm-hmm. I love it. Um, I make my tea, I get back into bed, I've got my book. Um, now that I've got a baby, my baby's also there. <laughs> <laughs> she is quietly playing with her toys, one might hope. <laughs> and yeah, I'm just like sipping on my Earl Grey and like kind of cozy, cozy vibes. Mm. Yum. And is the biscuits yeah. involved in this tea experience? Oh, at the moment it's hot cross buns. Oh, oh. I'm obsessed with hot cross buns. And Easter, how long was Easter? It was like two months ago. <laughs> hey, have Where you are you finding them? <laughs> I stockpiled and I'm a naughty lady. I, f- I froze like eight packs of hot cross buns. And so I've got, guys, I've got two packets left and it's going to be a oh. sad day when they're gone. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, but we, we, we can make you some. If you need and you're desperate, just let Please. me know. Please. Oh, yeah. I'm obsessed yeah. with hot cross buns. Mm. I'll send so you a good. very yeah. easy recipe as well. I'll make you a pack and I'll I pack, would love pack. that. I'll make you a I batch. I would love that. <laughs> I'm yeah, not going to batch never, them. <laughs> <laughs> I've never tried making them before. I, sh- I should, definitely. Mm. They mm. are surprisingly easy. But I've I suppose heard that. It would depend on the yeah. recipe as well, but um, mm-hmm. yeah. One, and once you've made, yeah. made once you've made them, you'll be like, "Oh my god, wow!" Yeah. Oh no, dangerous. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Um, yeah. In relation to your Earl Grey, what I- what are your mm-hmm. thoughts on the topic of Earl Grey with milk? Mm. You know, Ooh, some people say do not. Yeah, me too. No, I have but, mine with milk. I mm. love it. Some people but say no. I have most. Yeah, I have most of my teas with milk, so I get having it without the milk, mm-hmm. but I don't know. There's something about adding milk that's just so delicious. I See, I like my Earl Grey without the milk, and we were mm. just talking mm-hmm. about this Earl Grey um, that I'm drinking here um, yeah. from Tea Drop. This is a cream yeah. of Earl Grey, um, and they mm. use a white tea. So okay. it's definitely like an evening mm. tea. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, but it's got orange peel, rose petal, vanilla pods, and a cold-pressed bergamot oil. So it's Amazing. so light and yeah. fruity and delicious. Yeah. So you couldn't, you couldn't you could put milk, milk with that. that. No. No, I think if you try and add milk to a white tea, or I think it might work, but, yeah, it's just not. No, no milk. Mm, no milk. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, Beautiful. I get it. <laughs> yeah. I noticed you were drinking uh, on a post recently. It was like a banana cake chai. Could you explain to us that flavor Mm -hmm. profile? We want to live vicariously through you. Oh, my gosh. What is this tea? Mm. So it's banana bread chai. Um, I lived in the UK for a couple of years. There's a – yeah, it's really good. There's a brand. um, They're in the UK. They're called Bird and Blend, and they do all these amazing – yeah, blends, obviously bird and blend. Um, but it's a rooibos tea and mm-hmm. it's got vanilla, ginger. I think it's got cardamom in it. Um, yeah, it's really nice. It's kind of spicy. I love chai, but sometimes I find it a bit too spicy. You know, I want to drink mm-hmm. like a whole pot. Can't drink a whole pot of chai. It's too rich. Yes. Um, so I love this one because it's a little bit spicy, but it's not too sort of out there. And you can kind of just sit and drink, yeah, cups mm-hmm. and cups of it. It's really good. And it, on the packet it says tastes like banana bread straight out of the oven. Amazing. And I don't really like, yeah, I don't like comparing teas to food because I think people yeah. always get disappointed because it's like, well, <laughs> it's never going to be, it's never going to taste like banana bread straight out of the oven, you know. Mm-hmm. But I actually yes. thought, you know what, this does taste like banana bread. So it Ooh, was good. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. 
I love cooking with tea. So I'm mm. wondering whether your obsession mm-hmm. with tea extends beyond the cup. And do you have any favorite things mm. that you cook with with tea? Or are you a purist? I, tea no, must remain well, in the no. cup. <laughs> I love I love um, you know, like desserts and things made with tea. I'm just not much of a baker myself. Okay. Um I've always wanted to try it like I make, well, saying I'm not a baker, like I love making scones. I'd love to try making like an Earl Grey infused scone, um, but mm. I just never have. Like I love the flavor in food, but I've just never done it myself. Mm-hmm. You yeah. should definitely do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Look, now that Earl we're talking Grey about scones. it. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> definitely. Yes. Don't be surprised, Elise, if like in the next week or like month maybe <laughs> you see some <laughs> Earl Grey infused scones appear on my Instagram. Yes, do oh, it, look, do it. Yeah. I, I've got I a feeling I'm going to have to drop some um, – a batch of hot cross buns and um, – We can swap. A, yeah, maybe maybe uh, I'll soak the fruit in tea. That could be a thing. Oh, oh my goodness. Um, Don't. Yeah. Oh, yes. That would be amazing. Mm. Mm. And Love it. there's an Earl Grey tea cake recipe that I reckon I should forward yes. to you as well. It's mm-hmm. a very mm-hmm. easy one. I'm going to forward you. Okay. It's excellent. Please. Like, I like to bake, but the easier, the better mm. <laughs> for me. In this yeah. particular recipe, the yeah. Earl Grey tea leaves have – the um, kind of role that poppy seeds would have in a like an orange and poppy seed cake, and the okay. Earl Grey tea leaves oh. have just been bashed a little bit with a mortar and pestle, and so there's a little oh. bit of texture from them, and it's delicious. You'd think, oh, Yum. leaves in my cake, Mm-mm, it's fantastic. Mm. Oh my gosh, you have to send that oh, yeah. to me because I always think of it being um, like the tea itself, like a concentrated version of the the brew. Yes. But yeah, I love the idea of actual yes. tea leaves being in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Cool. Oh, well, Jordan, um, where could mm-hmm. our listeners find your tea adventures? Because they're not just tea adventures. Mm-hmm. They're also book adventures. Could you uh, explain are. how people could, um, yeah, I suppose, mm-hmm. follow along in your tea life? So I'm on Instagram at Jordan Lightyear. Um, and I basically just post about books and tea and now my baby as well, um, just like all day long. So, yeah, if you want <laughs> some book reviews, tea recommendations or just cute baby, the three best things in life, Jordan Lightyear. <laughs> oh, beautiful. I yeah. love that. Oh, it's so lovely yeah. to meet you and thank you yeah, for joining you us too. today. Thanks for having me. How fun. We heard from Jordan in relation to what is in her ultimate cup and where she is drinking it, Scotty Please, I want to know what is in your cup when it is the ultimate cup of tea. Where are you? What is in the cup? Oh, my favourite tea is probably, look, I'm a big Earl Grey fan. I drink that probably the most out of them all. And I just love the citrus notes from the bergamot. I'm a big bergamot fan. You know, it's like yuzu and bergamot. And so (laughs) bergamot... Um, maybe like a, a delicious sugary biscuit or shortbread mm. that goes with that book, Bergamont, um, a cookbook out the back in the garden, feet up, Aww. enjoying the tea, reading my cookbook, dreaming of all the foods I want to make. Aww. I think that's my perfect tea moment. Oh, it's lovely. I love it. <laughs> I love what it. about you? What about you? Oh, my perfect tea moment involves the people that I want to drink it with as well. Oh, okay. I have a tea garden because of my friend Al. When we were at uni, there were often times where I'd go over to her house and she would make a fresh tea. She would bash fresh ginger and fresh lemongrass from her garden. Oh, yes, yum. she grew lemongrass just so that she could make beautiful lemongrass and ginger tea, like super spicy, super fragrant because it's fresh. Uh, anyway, I grew a tea garden because of Al. Um, I dedicate my tea garden to you, Al. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my favourite teas that she also used to make um, – is a sage and mint tea with a beautiful oh, honey. And it could be any honey, but it needs to be local. It needs to be a honey that you've gotten from the farmer's market or a honey that you've gotten from a yes. beekeeper. And yes. I love to be really generous with a super duper heaped tablespoon of honey in a teapot with a nice handful of mint leaves, a handful of Yum. sage leaves. And that is 
probably my ultimate pot of tea in a glass teapot because I like to see what's in my tea and I like to see my leaves floating around and it's, yeah, it's with the people as well. I want to be drinking tea at Elle's house. I want to be tasting it in her company, in the company of some of my other girlfriends as well, Laura and Jen. Um, When I'm with them, you know, certain things taste better and tea is one of those things. Oh my God, I love that. Mm. Can I show you something fun? Yes. From from my garden? Yes. Look what I grew. I should Same. probably save this for show and tell. <laughs> Is it your show this, and tell? No, no. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll come up with something else. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I haven't what organized that yet. I will. This, this is a yuzu. Oh my gosh. I grew what is my only yuzu. My poor yuzu plant doesn't look very happy, but I mm. have a little tea, well, not tea garden, but like a herb garden with all my things in it. And I grew this. And you've just reminded me of one of my favorite teas with the peel from the yuzu infused in honey. So you get uh. the peel, you slice it up, and a big dollop of yuzu honey in the hot water. It is the ultimate. Okay, maybe we should do show and tell now. Yes. Should we? Yes. Do, is it time? It's time. Mm-hmm. I've given away half of my show and tell already, but that's okay because I have a second backup. Oh. Well, did you want to go first? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this was this is a little cookbook that I looked up. I tried to find a cookbook on tea. Yeah. And I've got lots of cookbooks that um, have – recipes that include tea and I quite often use I use tea more in my cooking than what I do in my cup which is an interesting fun fact about Scotty Bagnall Mm. Um, I think tea in like desserts and things and savory like I was talking about the spare ribs before teas and dessert are incredible anyhow I have got this fun book um which is vintage tea party and this is this is a super fun book. I don't know where I came across this. It's very random, but it's sort of like how to host a vintage tea party and it goes through all sorts of little fun things. Yeah, and it has the um, Union Jack behind. Who's that at the top of the dinner table on the cover, Scotty? Is that meant to be the queen? I think I think this is the author. Oh, Okay. <laughs> She looks like the queen. Um, this this seems to be a book that has triggered my thought process in relation to tea as a cultural thing because the vintage tea party, you know, w- w- of what culture is what I want to know. So what what is what is the journey of this book? The journey of this book is so much fun. Like it goes through how to find the perfect location. Um, there's all sorts of little things. The invitation, how to source the appropriate props um, for your own vintage tea party. Look at these gorgeous tea pots and oh, they're beautiful. sauces and plate. So this is for like an old English, like a British tea party, isn't it? I guess so, yes. Yeah, you know, the perfect yeah. headscarf. Had a fo- it's a very practical book. Will you be um, tying the perfect <laughs> headscarf? <laughs> I don't think I'll partake in the headscarfness. Oh. <laughs> um, but it's such a delightful, fun book. There are some gorgeous recipes in here as well, really lovely. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just full of all these fun facts, <gasps> all these beautiful like, Oh, well, look, can we use this book as inspiration? Can we host a tea party? Can I we? think so. That would Can be we have fun. a look at the rose petal sandwiches? Oh, okay, weird. So this picture, <laughs> this picture is of buttered white bread, crustless buttered white bread sprinkled with rose petals. I don't understand. I feel like that's not a good example. <laughs> <laughs> what is this book? <laughs> it is so fun. Evening mm. evening condiments. Um, yeah, mm. so I think we should use this as a bit of an inspiration. Charlie's chocolate figs. That looks fun. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> chocolate <laughs> figs. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Um, Scotty, I'm, I'm starting to think, you know, we haven't really touched on today how tea is a cultural experience. You know. We haven't. Um, Everyone around the world, you know, has a different experience of tea. Tea is so Mm. widely consumed. It is so, um, I suppose, so a part of identity to so many people. Um, And on one level it's 
are you a tea drinker of a co- or a coffee drinker? What is it that makes you mm. a tea drinker as opposed to a coffee drinker? And is it because of your cultural background? Um, tea as ceremonial, coffee as ceremonial. You know, yes. these are um, aspects of these drinks that have existed throughout history. And um, I suppose this is just a moment to acknowledge that, you know, we haven't touched on that today, but, um, you know, I want to go on a, a trip around the world experiencing tea in different places. The, the ceremony of tea. There's so mm. many cultural ceremonies of tea um, that are so ritualistic and mm. so embedded in a culture that it's just amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, um, you know, not only is there the reverence that you experience, you know, at a at a green tea ceremony in Japan or a... yes. Uh, a jasmine tea tasting in Chengdu, China, for example. Um, oh, you but also, do that. like, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> the world, <laughs> the world is open to us, Scotty. We'll get there. Um, but Next also, week we're coming to you from China. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but also the chaiwala in India, the tea maker. You know, being able to. You just buy a cup of chai off the side of the road. It's it's a way of life, and um, having your favourite tea maker is also you know something that is discussed. It's a part of it's a part of belonging to an area. Um, yes. Mm. I I found out a fun fact about tea in my research today. Actually, that tea was. A happy accident. I love how some of these things, I often wonder how things come to be. Like what was the moment that that ingredient or food was discovered and how was it discovered? Mm. And I did a bit of research in terms of tea and it was discovered a very long time ago, 2737, Mm. 2737 BC. That means it's been here forever. (laughs) <laughs> it's been it. here forever, mm. but it was a Chinese emperor called Shen Nung, and he was um, just sitting underneath a tree, which happened to be a camellia sensus, um, which is a tea tree, and his servant was boiling drinking water for him to drink, and some of the leaves from the tea accidentally fell into the water, and they tried the water uh, with the tea leaves in there, and hence tea was discovered. Wow. That's a beautiful story. That's, How fun is that? So the origin of tea is China. Is that what we are going to deduce yes. from this? I've, I feel like that's what my Googling told me today. You know, you never mm. can 100% rely on Google. I wonder what varietal it was. Was it green? Well, of course. It was. It just fell from the tree. Interesting. It fell from the tree, yeah. yeah. I have some show and tell, Scotty. Excellent. I'm it's, excited. And it's tea related. I, it's tea related. I'm quite similar to Jordan in that I have too many teapots than what I probably should own. Mm. And Adam is aware of my tea obsession. So he had a TB teapot painting commissioned for me. Or it's, <laughs> what? It's, it's, it's not a painting, sorry. It's a drawing. Um, he contacted an artist here in Melbourne. Um, <laughs> you can find her on Instagram. Her handle is at Steph underscore draws underco- underscore stuff. Steph draws stuff and <laughs> she drew me a TB teapot. It's my dog, Tibby, his face is on a teapot and we got it framed. <laughs> oh, my God, that is divine. Isn't it beautiful? It instead is of, so cute. Instead of just getting TB drawn, it's a TB teapot and that's my show and tell. teapot. Mm. <laughs> that's a collision of all of your loves in the one painting. I love it. Yeah. Well, except Adam's not there, but Adam commissioned it. Oh, so I thought I feel you were like going to say there. Coco wasn't there. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> Coco's a new love. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to need to get like a, a Coco cafetiera or something painted or drawn. Oh, yes. Can you mm, do that? A Coco cafetiera. Yes. Oh, yay. Little Coco baby. <laughs> oh, well, this week we have discussed infusions. Last week, we spoke fusion food. Next week, Mm. what are we talking about, Scotty? Confusion. (laughs) Ah, Who knows? Who knows? We haven't quite gotten there yet. We've got a few ideas, but... We'll work it out. Yeah, we'll work it out. You'll listen and look forward to it. (laughs)
So if you've got any ideas, please send us your thoughts so we can include them in our upcoming podcast. We love to hear from you. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our episode. Um, we hope you're enjoying it on all of your podcast stations um, and we'd love your feedback. So please contact us, Scotty and Elise at gmail.com. We'll see you next week. See you next week. You've been listening to Cream, Eggs and Jam. I'm Elise Pulbrook and you can find me on Instagram at Elise underscore food person. And I'm Scott Bagnall and you can find me on Instagram at SS Bagnall. If you'd like to send us your show and tell, you can email us scottyandelise at gmail.com. Or if you'd like the visual experience of this podcast, you can find us on YouTube at Cream, Eggs and Jam. Have a great day. Happy baking.